It is a myth that you would get fined for picking a trillium. You wouldn't believe how old this tree is. This tree is actually over 500 years old. This is a good place to find a salamander. Ooh, we got lucky today. Here we actually see a couple bumblebees on our wild bergamot. Hi everyone, my name's Ranger M and I work at Catfish Creek Conservation Authority. I'm the community outreach technician and that means I do a lot of this chatting about all things nature and conservation with kids, adults, teachers, everyone. I love to knowledge share and that's just what I'm gonna do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. The Carolini Life Zone is a very unique area in Southern Ontario. Life Zone, or also known as an ecoregion, is a very specific ecosystem that's defined by geography and climate. Scientists have been studying this area for years and have found that there's an imaginary line that runs from Grand Bend to Toronto and covers about 22,000 kilometers squared, and that there's a distinct difference between flora, which is another word for plants, and fauna, which is another word for animals, from the other areas in Ontario. The climate is what makes this area so unique. We are bounded by four lakes, Lake Huron, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, and Lake St. Clair. And those four lakes make a unique system called a moderating effect, which creates very mild winters and the warmest overall annual temperatures, which causes a very long growing season, actually the longest in all of Ontario. That's why we have a little nickname called the Banana Belt. The Carolinian Life Zone is actually incredibly small. If you looked at a map of all of Canada, you would see that it's actually less than 1% of Canada's entire land mass. But on this tiny chunk of land, there is a huge variety of wildlife that you only find in this area of Canada. It actually holds about one third of Canada's rare and at-risk species, which means they're species that are threatened, endangered, and at risk of becoming extinct that you only find in this area. That's why it's so important to protect this ecosystem. Another reason to protect the Carolinian life zone is because of all the unique habitats, like wetlands, tall grass prairies, and the mature old growth forests. It's estimated that there's only 10% of the original Carolinian life zone remaining. One of the main reasons of the loss of the Carolinian life zone is the introduction of humans. Remember when I said the Carolinian life zone only is about 1% of Canada's entire land mass? On this little chunk of land, there is 25% of Canada's entire human population. That is around 10 million Canadians living on this tiny chunk of land. And it puts a lot of pressure on our local wildlife and habitats. The Carolinian Life Zone is also home to some very cool things. There's two UNESCO World Biosphere Reserves, one in Long Point and one the Niagara Escarpment. There's the world's largest freshwater delta at the St. Clair River. And there's North America's most well-known bird watching site on Point Pelee Island. Also, it's home to the world's best forest. Everyone, welcome to Springwater Forest and Conservation Area. Do you remember the four lakes that surround the Carolinian Life Zone? Four lakes are St. Clair, Huron, Erie, and Ontario. Did you know Lake Erie is the most biodiverse of the Great Lakes? It holds over 50% of all fish found in the Great Lakes. This is the lake Catfish Creek, Kettle Creek, and Thames River all flow into. We're in Springwater Forest now and we're gonna see what kind of wildlife we can find. Come on, let's go. So this is skunk cabbage, a very common plant we find in the forest. And a lot of people think it smells so strongly of skunk to, to uh, scare away predators, but it actually smells like this to attract a certain insect. And that's the carrion fly. The carrion fly is the only fly that can pollinate the skunk cabbage. And carrion means dead flesh. So that's why it smells so pungent. So this is a Canadian mayapple. It has a very unique leaf, very big, and they hang sort of like umbrellas. They kind of look like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. The fruit is normally here. It's a little late in their season, so they are um, getting a little old. But if this is actually a unique species only found in the Carolinian life zone. And there's actually two different plants, one with only one leaf and then two. It's the difference between a male and female plant. This is the trillium, which is the symbol of Ontario and our uh, provincial plant. 
Uh, it is a myth that you would get fined for picking a trillium. You don't actually get fined, but it is uh, a native wild plant, so you never really want to pick uh, plants anyways. The trillium does come in several different colors. Uh, traditionally, you see pictures of the white trillium, but this one was uh, a dark red, and there are some that are yellow, and some that are actually white and green. The trilliums you see really come out in April, May, early spring. They are one of the first uh, flowers you see after winter. This is bloodroot. Uh, it also has a very unique leaf, pretty easy to identify, and it really gets its name from its root system. It's bright red, and actually back in the day, indigenous people used to use the dye that came out of the roots uh, for several different things. One with their clothing and also war paint. So to ID poison ivy, uh, the easiest way is obviously three leaves, leave it be. Uh, but the second best way is I find the two side leaves are going to look a little different. They're going to look like they have a mitten on them. So they have one lobe for the thumb and then another lobe for all of three together. So a bigger lobe. And then the third middle leaf does stick up higher than the other two. And then sometimes they have a red stem, but not all of the time. So that's not the best way to go on for poison ivy. Safest bet, three leaves, leave it be. If you've ever been to Springwater Conservation Area, you would have noticed the pond in the middle of the forest. This is Springwater Pond. Uh, it's not too big and it does get a little deep, but not out here in the middle of the forest. You can see a lot of stumps in the middle of the pond, and those are actually old chestnut tree stumps. Um, back in the 40s, a blight went through and killed off most of the chestnut trees in the forest that the previous owner, Fred White, went through and cut down the rest of the chestnut trees. Now we see the stumps in the middle of the pond. Also in the pond right now, you can notice the water lilies. Water lilies actually open during the day when the sunlight hits them and close at night. This is wild ginger. Uh, if you dig it up, the root won't look the same as what you get in the grocery store, but you can still brew the leaf of the ginger plant and it would be, make a great tea and it smells very similar to ginger. Uh, the easy way to ID ginger is its heart-shaped leaf and it's fuzzy, the, the fuzzy back to the leaf as well. So due to the chestnut blight that went through in the 40s, American chestnut trees are now incredibly endangered. So we're working with the Canadian Chestnut Council to re-establish them. So that's actually what this is, a chestnut tree sapling. This white fence is to protect it from deer because they love munching on some tree leaves. And it's about one years old since being planted in the forest. And so far it's doing pretty good. So we're really hopeful that American chestnut trees can come back to Springwater Forest. So you can see new growth is down here as well, which is another sign the tree is doing really well. This is an American beech tree, like I mentioned before. Uh, so Springwater was about 60% beech trees. It's a very common tree, especially to find in the Carolinian life zone. But unfortunately, uh, due to the introduction of an insect, there was a disease that happened and has been killing off most of our beech trees. Normally, the, we see kind of a reddish or white rash on the tree bark and that's a sign that the tree is very hollow, very weak, and could be pushed down by some wind. So we normally take them out. You can see some of the effects, effects of the disease on the leaves. They are kind of crippled in together. That's a sign that the tree is not doing too well. Beech trees are really easy to ID because they have this really smooth gray bark, but that also means that uh, they are very common for people to carve on. And as you see here, this tree has been a subject of that. Unfortunately, it's very unhealthy for a tree to be carved into. It's kind of like you're carving into the skin of the tree. So just like us, when we get a cut, uh, we really have to let it scab over to heal. Unfortunately, with a tree, it can't scab over and it can't heal when it's carved into like this. So it does slowly kill the tree. Some of the beech trees we did keep up as long as they weren't a hazard to the trail or to humans walking on the trails. Like this one, we did keep up because it's called a wildlife tree. You can see how 
uh, vital it has been to the survival of our local woodpeckers. So they've made quite a dent in it and it's actually the pileated woodpecker that has uh, dove into this tree. Uh, you can tell by the size of the holes and what, um, the chunks it can take out. So they can take out a chunk that's basically the size of my palm. Uh, they are the lar largest woodpecker in North America. So both the male and female pileated woodpeckers have the red mohawk. It's actually the red mustache you're looking for. That's the male. So dead trees are important to woodpeckers, but the trees are just as important after the woodpeckers are done because a lot of animals use these holes, which are actually called cavities, for homes afterwards. Uh, very commonly raccoons, um, chipmunks, squirrels, bats, owls, other birds all use these cavities for homes after the woodpeckers are done with them. This is a yellow birch tree. Uh, the way to ID a yellow birch tree is thinking of a tree on stilts. Very commonly you will see the roots out of the ground just like this one because they have the ability to grow up and around fallen logs, rocks, other trees and stuff like that. So you can see here this tree probably grew up and around a fallen log that's now decomposed and um, back into the soil. Another way to ID them is the bark. If you look farther up, you can see it's kind of papery, just like a white birch would be. A fun fact about the yellow birch tree is you can collect the sap and make a yellow birch syrup. And it is more intensive than maple syrup, where maple syrup, you need about 40 buckets of sap to make one bucket of maple syrup. You need about 70 buckets of sap from a yellow birch tree to make one bucket of syrup. So it's more expensive than maple syrup and apparently a bit bitter and a delicacy up north. So this is a red oak tree, meaning it's a nut bearing tree, which is also known as a mast tree. You wouldn't believe how old this tree is. This tree is actually over 500 years old. We had a specialist come in and take a core sample of this tree. So that means he took a tiny drill, drilled a little hole into this tree and took out a sample and studied it with his microscope to age the tree. That sample also told, told him different things about climate change, uh, different things that have happened over the years like huge frost events or maybe flooding events. Do you know the nut that an oak produces? The oak tree produces acorns. Did you know that squirrels find only about 70% of the acorns they bury in the spring? Meaning they are one of the largest contributors to the success of oak trees. Welcome to the Springwater Boardwalk. Fun fact about Ranger M, I helped build this boardwalk back when I was in high school with the environmental leadership program at the local high school, East Elgin Secondary School. The boardwalk was the only way we could connect the North Trail and the South Trail of the Springwater Forest. It's going over top of one of the marshes we can find in Springwater Conservation Area. Let's go check it out. These are cattail. Uh, a cool fact about cattail is the entire plant is edible down to its roots. The root is actually very tasty pickled. This is a good place to find a salamander uh, because they like the moist, warm area under fallen logs. Ooh, we got lucky today. This is a red-backed salamander. Uh, it is true that if uh, a salamander is threatened by a predator, uh, they will drop their own tail uh, because their tail then flops around looking like prey as well. So the predator is most likely to go after the tail and that's when the salamander can escape. This little guy looks like he was threatened, so he lost his tail, but he's actually growing a new tail. Salamanders are amphibians. That means they start their life cycle in the water, but when they get old enough, they get exit the water, uh, they get rid of their gills, and they now breathe through their skin. So you definitely don't want to touch salamanders, especially if you have just put sunscreen on or bug repellent, because you touch them and that goes right into their system which I don't know about you, but I don't want to eat bug spray or sunscreen. And especially right now, hand sanitizer. That would probably not be comfortable. So the best thing to do is not touch them at all. You can just observe them. 
I'm touching this little guy because I know how to do it properly and safely for myself and him. Up above us here is a nest built by squirrels. They use a lot of debris like leaves and needles to build their nests high up in trees away from predators. There's four common pine tree species we find in Ontario and I'm going to teach you a cool way to ID them. First we have the white pine which is this tree right here. It's actually the provincial tree of Ontario. The easiest way to ID a white pine is with the needles. So each bundle of needles for a white pine come in fives. And how do you spell white? W-H-I-T-E. Five letters in white, five needles in a bundle. And then we go to our red pine right here that not only has a pinkish red bark, but if we go from our five from white, we go down to two long red needles for a red pine. And then the next tree is a jack pine, which is two short needles, like a jackrabbit, like bunny ears. And then the final pine is a scot or scotch pine, which are two twist, twisted needles that go like this. So five for white, two long red needles for red pine, two short needles for jack pine, and then two twisted needles for scot pine. Jack pine trees establish very quickly after forest fires, and that's because their seeds, which are contained in their pine cones, open up during in a fire, so that means their seeds are ready to go right after a forest fire. You can find over 2,200 unique vascular plant species in the Carolinian life zone. 60 of those species are fern species. 70 of them are unique tree species. So this big tree is a yellow birch tree, and then this one is a black cherry tree. As you can see, this one is growing straight out of the yellow birch, and this probably happened because a squirrel buried the black cherry uh, nut in the base of the yellow birch and then forgot to find it in the spring. So this kind of happened, which is really cool to see. An easy way to ID a black cherry tree is based on the bark. So it's a very dark color, and then also the small bark pieces are flaring up at the top and the bottoms, kind of looking like burnt cornflakes, and that's how I remember. This is the cucumber tree. It's really rare to find in the Carolinian forest because it's really endangered. There's only about 100 remaining in Canada. It gets its name from its fruit because it kind of resembles a cucumber. Fun fact, it is the only native magnolia tree to Canada, and early Americans used to use the immature fruit to flavor their whiskey. When walking through a forest, you always want to remember to stay on the path, and that's because you don't want to touch poison ivy. You also don't want to stomp through wildlife's home. So the forest floor is home to many insects, amphibians and everything like that so you don't want to just go walking through the forest you want to stay on the path. Do you know which butterfly has the longest migration trek in North America? Do you know which butterfly has the longest migration trek in North America? The monarch butterfly. Fun fact, in the fall, monarchs travel up to 3,000 kilometers between their breeding grounds in southwestern Ontario and their overwintering sites in central Mexico. This is the Springwater Pollinator Garden. We just put it in last year with the help of TD Friends of the Environment, local volunteers, and the MNRF Stewardship Ranger Program. It is just down from the Catfish Creek Admin Center and just beside our campground. Pollinators are vital to every ecosystem. A lot of plants and trees also depend on them and us. You can thank a pollinator for every third bite of food you take. Pollination is the transfer of pollen from the male part of one plant to the female part of another plant. This can be done through wind, water, or most commonly via the body of an animal, like our pollinators. This allows the plants to have plant babies called seedlings and to produce our food. Most of our fruit, veggies, and crops depend on pollinators to transfer pollen. Pollinators can be bees, butterflies, beetles, hummingbirds, and even bats. Recently, scientists have seen a dramatic decrease in our pollinators, specifically bumblebees and monarch butterflies. A majority of this decline is due to the loss of habitat and our agricultural practices. 
We wanted to dedicate an area to the pollinators, but also an educational opportunity for when community members come to visit the campground and the trails to come and learn about pollinators. Also, how they can help them out, like planting wildflowers. So this side of our garden is purely designated to wildflowers and pollinator specific flowers. Whereas this side over here, we've designated to wildflowers as well, but also tall grass prairie species. We'll learn more about tall grass prairies in another episode, but first let's go check out some wildflowers. We wanted to make sure we planted a lot of different wildflowers. One, because diversity is so important, and two, because color is important. Different pollinators are attracted to different colors. One being bumblebees love yellow, and you can see we have a lot of yellow. These are black-eyed Susans. They're very easy to grow, as you can see, and bumblebees love them. All bees actually really like them. A couple other yellow plants we have are these ones. They're called false sunflower. They get really tall. And then there's these ones, they're called cone flowers. Another color we have is white. So one plant is this one, it's Queen Anne's lace. Queen Anne's lace got its name from the story of Queen Anne making lace. And she accidentally pricked her finger and one drop of blood oozed out. And you can see right in the middle of the flower, the little itty bitty reddish purple flower that represents the blood. One more white flower we have here is this one. It's called the Virginia Mountain Mint. It's also a common plant and it got its name from its mint-like flowers. Another color is purple. Monarch butterflies like purple. This one right here is called a cone flower, a purple cone flower. And it actually is echinacea. Echinacea is commonly used in medicine for keeping away colds. You can see with these two plants, they're two different colors, but they're the same plant. They're known as wild bergamot or also bee balm. Here we actually see a couple bumblebees on our wild bergamot. You can see the way the bumblebee is going in on what looks like the petals of the flowers, but that's actually where the nectar is. It's kind of like a cylinder and the nectar's inside those little petals, not in the middle of the flower. One issue with any ecosystem is making sure invasive species don't get in. Unfortunately, we have had an issue with the Japanese beetle. So you can see here on this plant, the Japanese beetle eats the plant material in between the vines on the plant. They kind of make it look like a skeleton. It's not good for the plant. So we have to find a way to take care of the Japanese beetle. We're most likely gonna have to buy those Japanese beetle traps that attract them and only them. And hopefully that'll eradicate the issue. So thank you for visiting Springwater Pollinator Garden. I do just wanna remind you that in a natural setting, you don't wanna just walk through a pollinator garden or a tall grass prairie because there are ticks and wildlife all in there. So you don't wanna walk through like I am. I am doing it safely and in knowledge that I'm gonna check myself for ticks after and I'm being careful of wildlife. So thanks again for joining us. Before we go, I've got an activity you can try yourself. Let's play nature bingo. This fun play on bingo gets you outside and exploring a natural space more than you normally would. To try and fill a line to be the first one to yell, bingo! Challenge yourself by trying to fill the entire sheet. You can get a printable version of this card at catfishcreek.ca 